Hello, welcome to Theology Thursday. Today I want to talk about the armor of God, but I want to, if you stay to the end, I want to show you something about the armor of God that most people don't consider and I think is very important and very instructive for us. So in Ephesians chapter 6, we find this uh, instruction from the Apostle Paul, and this is what he says, starting um, in uh, uh, verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6. So Ephesians 6, 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of grace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So there have been many books written and plenty of websites that you can go to that talk about the armor of God and each piece of the armor. I'll talk about each of those briefly. Then I'll set it in its immediate context, and then we'll set it in a broader context that I think helps us understand really what the Bible is telling us about the armor of God. So there are several pieces of armor here. The Apostle Paul just pulls them out. Some of them are actually quotes from the Old Testament, such as the helmet of salvation. But the, the belt of truth, of course, is the belt that they would wear around and, and um, they would hang their weapons from it. it would, they would use it to gird their loins. Um, and so it's the belt of truth. So we need truth. And of course, truth is ultimately found um, in God's word. But I do want to talk a little bit about the girding the loins because I think it's important for what happens when you go into battle. They wore robes, as you know, that oftentimes would hang all the way to their ankles. Fighting, wearing a robe that hangs to your ankles is not the best way to do it. And so what they would do is they would take the back of the robe and pull it up and tuck it into their belt, essentially turning the robe into a pair of shorts. And that would allow you movement. It wouldn't be anything you get entangled with or tripped up. And so the belt was used primarily to gird the loins. Um, and so turn into a pair of shorts that were ready to fight. And so we'd use the belt of truth to do that. So you and I need the truth from God's word. Uh, the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is straightness as opposed to iniquity, which is bitness. And uh, it is a conformity to God's standards. So God is straight, and we conform to him, and we live a life of straightness. Um, <clears throat> then for shoes, um, the gospel of peace. Of course, military shoes, were they wore basically wooden sandals. So they would take spikes and drive them through the sandals so that the, the spike would stick out the bottom, and that would give them, you know, like cleats, give them good traction in battle because you're fighting someone with a sword. last thing you would do is have your feet go out from underneath you in which case you're going to die. And so um, the shoes obviously were very important because they kept them from slipping. And the gospel of peace is the good news of peace, uh, that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Um, And then the shield of faith. And they would have a shield. Oftentimes they would take a piece of leather and put it over the outside of the shield and soak the leather in water because if someone's shooting uh, flaming arrows at you, you know, dip them in tar or pitch or something and then shoot them. Uh, not only would the shield catch it, but it would, the wet leather would extinguish um, the darts. So it's the shield of faith. And this is the ongoing faith that we have in our God. And then that's why he talks about the flaming darts, the flaming arrows of the evil one. Then the helmet, of course, is important. The helmet of salvation, um, which is uh, again, the fact that we've been saved from our sins by Jesus Christ. Um, it's interesting that for the most part, these are declarations kind of, well, not kind of, but are declarations of who we are in Jesus. We have his righteousness. We have his truth. We have his salvation. We have his good news. We have his peace. Uh, our faith is in 
him. Uh, the focus really is on Jesus and who he is and where we stand in him. And, and I'll show you in a minute why I think this is important. And then the last one is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So he begins with truth and he ends with truth. Uh, you know, the uh, belt of truth and then the uh, sword of the spirit, which is the only offensive weapon that we have here <clears throat> mentioned. And of course, he says that is the word of God, that we wield the word of God when we are in battle with our enemy. Okay? Now, I want to set these, this armor of God in the context. You know, starting verse 10, he's really talking about spiritual warfare. Uh, be strong in the Lord. Um, this word strong means uh, it's like a, a dynamo. It's always producing energy. You and I can only produce energy for a while. Then we have to go to bed or take a nap on the, in the recliner or whatever it is. We do not have an endless supply of energy. We have to resupply our energy by eating and drinking water. And so God is not like that. God is his own endless, inexhaustible supply of energy and power. And so we stand strong in his power that is eternal and unending and unwavering and never runs out. So we stand in his uh, might and in his strength that God has. We put on the whole armor of God. We recognize our position in Jesus Christ so we can stand against the, 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 the schemes, the methods, the plans, the deceptiveness of the devil uh, because you and I don't face the devil physically. This is a spiritual battle. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, against rulers and authorities and cosmic powers. These are all the demonic levels and organizations, uh, spiritual forces of evil. Uh, they're in the heavenly places. So we are in a spiritual battle. Um, but the description of these pieces of armor are so often related to who we are in Jesus. We've been saved. We're in his truth. We have his word. Um, we have his uh, salvation. <clears throat> we have his peace, his gospel. That goes back to a broader context. So I want to go all the way back into uh, Ephesians chapter 5, early um, in that chapter. And I, wanna, I want to, to, to pick up, um, uh, we'll just pick up in verse 15. Uh, 16 is where I really want to start, but let's start with verse 15. Uh, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, because we're in a time of evil, and we're always in a time of evil until Jesus comes back. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So what is the will of the Lord? And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, he's showing a contrast. Um, if you are drunk, you're under the control of alcohol. Instead, we need to be down under control of the Holy Spirit. So he uses drunkenness kind of as a picture of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Drunkenness, you're under control of the alcohol. Instead, we need to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. This is not really a statement about the consumption of alcohol as much as it is about being consumed ourselves by the Holy Spirit, that we are filled in the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Holy Spirit, okay? So we need to be filled with the Spirit. Now, that's very critical. And then, now watch what happens, what kind of flows out of this. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So worship is the first thing that comes out, and it is a communal worship because we're encouraging one another. That's why we gather for worship. Um, <clears throat> that's why we meet together for worship. That's why we're commanded to meet on Sundays together for worship because we not just fellowship, which is important, but there's an encouragement element from that, encouraging one another <clears throat> um, to, to walk with God. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So worship, thanksgiving. Now watch this. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. So be filled with the Spirit, which leads to worship and thanksgiving. And then he begins to discuss family relationships. He starts with wives and gives them some instructions. And then in verse 25, he gives instructions to husbands. And those goes, go on. Actually, it's a pretty lengthy description. Um, the wives only get a couple of verses. Um, 
Husbands get quite a few. Uh, and then at the beginning of chapter six, he deals with children and parents. And then starting in verse five of uh, Ephesians six, he starts dealing with slaves and masters. In this context, probably closer to what we think of as employer and employee, um, rather than kind of what we think of as slaves in a, like the American sense of the 1700s, 1800s. And I have another whole Theology Thursday on slavery in the Bible, if you want to watch that at some point. So watch what we have. Be filled with the Spirit, which leads to worship and thanksgiving. But that also leads to wives behaving as they should and husbands behaving as they should, because that's the most important of all human relationships that we have, is marriage. And then children and parents and how they should behave towards one another. And then the next important relationship we have, which is where much of our time is spent, is in our field of labor, our careers, masters and slaves, or employees and employers. Uh, the Bible doesn't use words employee and employers. It just uses master and slave for all kinds of stuff. And so the idea is when we're filled with the Spirit, we have a right relationship with God through worship and thanksgiving. We have a right marital relationship, the most important one. We have a right parental relationship, the next most important one. We have a, a right worship, or excuse me, work relationship, which is the next important. So he moves through an order of importance. God relationship, spouse relationship, parental relationship, work relationship. This really kind of summarizes almost all the relationships that we have. Uh, the vast majority of them are, we, are, we have friendships in church, we have family, we have people with colleagues that we work with. Those are the people we spend the bulk of our time with. Yes, there are other, other friendships that we develop outside of that. <clears throat> and I have them and you have them. But the reality is this is where the bulk of my life is spent are in, in these relationships. So if you're the devil, what do you want to do? You want to separate people from worshiping God. You want to keep people from attending church and being encouraged to continue to walk with Christ. Try to isolate them from the need of community, Christian community. You want to cause marital strife. You want to cause issues between children and parents. You want to cause issues in work because that affects our finances and everything else about us. Or maybe we're tempted to cheat at work or whatever it is. In other words, these are the places where we're going to get the biggest onslaught from Satan are in all of these kind of places because this is the bulk of where our life is spent. And this is where we've invested our life. We invested in our marriage. We invested in our kids. We invested in our parents. We invested in um, what we do for a career, what we do for work, how we make a living. Um, oftentimes, we even find much of our identity in those places. And obviously, the most important one, the one he listed first, was our relationship with God. And so after all those discussions, then he says, finally, okay, put on the whole armor of God. So the whole armor of God is not about you and me going out and fighting against demonic forces. Really, what it's about is you and I making sure that our relationship with God is right and the most important human relationships we have are right. Because this is where the biggest attacks are going to come. This is where the, 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 the assaults of the enemy are going to be relentless. And so you and I need to keep the armor of God. And here's what's interesting. If you know you're going into battle, you're going to put on the armor. But when you come home, there's a tendency to let your guard down. I'm at home, I'm safe. And the reality is the devil knows this. And so if you and I know I'm going to be having a discussion with an un, a non-believer about Jesus, and I know that that's going to be spiritual warfare, then we're ready for it. We've put on the armor. But to think I need to have the armor of God on when I'm at the dinner table with my family? Like we don't think that. That's why understanding this in its broader context, I think is so helpful. Um, you and I need the armor of God every day, but particularly in those places where we tend to let our guard down. And when we do, sometimes that's where the sneak attack from our enemy comes because he is scheming all the time. And so I want to encourage you, don't think of the armor as God, of God as what I put on when I'm about to do battle with Satan kind of mentality, um, but rather the armor of God is what I need to rely on, who I am in Jesus, being filled with the Spirit all the time, doing things the way Jesus wants me to do them, is most important in those places where it's the easiest for me to let down my guard and also is the easiest for the real me to come out. Um, and, for, you know, and so those relationships that we have 
Um, where it's easy to just kind of relax, let your guard down and all, boom, that's where our enemy's gonna look to attack and try to cause division and strife uh, in the home, at work, between parents and children and those kind of things. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the armor, but kind of set it in that broader context to really help us understand the importance of the armor of God all the time, not just when we know that we're going to be going into a spiritual battle. So I hope that you will walk all the time filled with the Spirit, under His control, clothed in the armor of God, uh, so that you will have victory over an enemy who is scheming to pull you down at the times you least expect it. God bless you.